much, Dan. And uh, it's great to see such a really well-filled hall tonight at um, the theatre at Melbourne Uni. It's wonderful to have you all here joining us. And I thought, um, so Tim's EA sent me a message saying, can you send us the questions? <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> so we don't do that. Um, so, and Tim just said to me, actually, my EA has just joined me, so she doesn't know that I don't read the questions anyway. So <laughs> I saved her a lot of time and Tim heartache that he didn't even know he was having. So I thought that I would actually start tonight with kind of the speed dating questions, just to kind of warm us up. And then we get into some more detailed questions and then we're going to go to the whole group so that you can ask some questions. So the speed dating questions have to be really fast answers, you know, just literally what just comes on the top of your mind, you two. And we'll find out how much, you know, in sync these, this father and son duo is or not. Um, and, what, and then later we'll find out what they really think or not. And then we might even find out what they think about each other or not, <laughs> depending how it all goes. So um, just some quick warm-up questions. And this is, um, as I said, yes or no, or what are the options I give you. So uh, peanut butter, chunky or smooth? Tim? Um, why is the father and the son doing speed dating? What sort of part? <laughs> doing it with them. Oh, it's okay. It's not about you right. two. Ah, uh, chunky. Started that. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Chunky? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, AFL, yes or no? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, I do <laughs> Yes, I do oh, It's going well so far. Yes. Competitive, yes or no? Uh, Elliot, tell them about our tennis matches. Yeah, I beat that every time. So, <laughs> uh, yes, both very competitive. Are you answering for your father now? Tim, do you agree? Yeah, very competitive. <laughs> uh, if you were one of the three musketeers, which one would you be? Elliot? I haven't even seen it. I, I haven't <laughs> seen it. <laughs> no idea. Ben, who are they? <laughs> D'Artagnan looks like Ben, which is why I just came up with that. With that. Um, would you like to look like Ben? Uh, yeah, in a few I do like his goatee, it looks great. That's right. You guys, okay, so we have established that you have quite similar tastes and ideas about things. So let's go a little bit deeper on the, on the speed dating. So I would like to know the relationship or chance meeting that you think most shaped who you are today. Tim. So I think it was uh, when I was 16, 17, and it was in a church circle, both my brother and I, you wouldn't have heard of my brother, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, were invited to do open air preaching, it was a church setting, uh, in caravan parks, hostile audiences, when people say to me, how come you're articulate and your brother dominated parliament when he was there, I say, open air preaching, <laughs> you actually learn to think on your feet and to engage, that chance meeting with those people I think honed skills. Wow. Elle? Um, mine was probably a little bit later, about 22 years old, travelling in India. And um, it was actually visiting a World Vision program in um, Jaipur, capital of Rajasthan, with two great friends, Scott Duncan and Ravi Pressa, um, who have been formative partners in WIGA. And uh, after visiting World Vision's work, um, going into a small um, slum just on the outskirts of Jaipur, um, we, I met a group of young uh, boys and we were taken into it a tiny little room where essentially uh, 10 young kids were forced to sew beads into a sari uh, for about 15 to 16 hours each and every day and met Muhammad, a 10 year old that had been sold at the age of 5, 50 US dollars and trafficked from Tamanado up to Jaipur. It wasn't until we left and ushered out with World Vision that another young boy, about 17, 17 year old, grabbed at my arm and said, oh Elliot, um, you've got to come play cricket with us. And uh, I stupidly told him that my uncle's Ricky Ponting. <laughs> it's not. It's obviously former treasurer, which, is, which got um, these kids very excited and being Australian and at the time Matthew Hayden and Shane Warne and Ricky Ponting, the heroes of the 2007 uh, era, um, it said I have to go play cricket, but World Vision would let me and so I took John T's number, returned the next day with Ravi and Scott and we played a cricket match for about two and a half hours on a dusty, dirty pitch with barbed wire and it came down to the last over, I was bowling and got carded nearly for six, Ravi took a catch and we won the game and uh, taken back to Jonty's house, uh, met his mother, father, and celebrated the, the joys of our childhood and being young and free to play this cricket game. 
but um, over this chai tea, piercing out into the sunset, realised that um, this whole two and a half hours we had to play our cricket game, that um, Muhammad, one of the young ten boys I met the day before, had been locked up in servitude and forced to work uh, for only two hours of 15 hour days. Muhammad would have given his right leg to be with us during that cricket match. So uh, I was at the time about to start a career at Pricewaterhouse Cookers, which I still did, but it was certainly motivation to think uh, broader than uh, a straight accounting degree. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I just want to dig into a little bit more to that, Tim, and that idea about the fact that we have experiences that create our values and our mm. worldview. So mm. what, what is the experiences that you've had or the key that created your value set and your worldview today? So uh, in my family's case, a uh, brother and a sister, um, if you didn't know I had a sister, she's actually the best of the Costellos. She even has <laughs> friends and she's nice. <laughs> um, um, the impact really was our parents. So both were teachers, one in the private sector, one in the state school sector. and. Uh, the, the power of curiosity, as good teachers have, why and what are you interested in, and drawing out questions. And um, Lunches on weekends would go for two hours, three hours. I, I remember when I was about 10 or 11, a, a young friend of mine, I was the same age, uh, saying, your family is seriously weird. <laughs> and I said, why? And they, he said, Sunday lunch. We bolt it down and we go and play footy or turn on what was then called World of Sport. Your family's weird, you just stay and talk. And I actually thought all families did that. But uh, they don't. And really the, the family was the shaper of values. And the, the most critical value, even though you know, it was pretty middle class, humble circumstances, we three bedroom, Weatherboard house in Blackburn we grew up in. I shared a bedroom with my brother for 17 years and that's where I got interested in justice, actually. <laughs> anyway, I won't go there. And um, that sense that you're blessed, even though you know, it's pretty humble circumstances by today's standards, you're blessed. You can make a difference. You need to give back. Whatever skills, talents you have, you actually have this duty. That value has really seeped into us. Mm. Now what about for you, Al? And how has this intergenerational transfer occurred? <laughs> Look, it has, um, and I probably haven't even expressed it to Dad, but um, it was definitely my upbringing. And um, Dad's work and service as um, Mayor of St Kilda, but also uh, the leader of St Kilda Baptist Church as the minister there, um, met, we lived, lived in St Kilda. Um, St Kilda in the mid to late 1980s was a very different place to what it is now. And um, all of my friends growing up were predominantly from migrant families, Cambodians, Russians, Vietnamese, Indians. And so my brother and I had uh, a real upbringing in sort of backyards and parks and jumping over fen fences into different flats. But it was the types of people that came into our house on a weekly basis the prostitutes and drug addicts and men with mental illnesses that uh, dad and mum both cared for. And it wasn't until, I realised this was unique, until I went to a local private school against my will. I uh, went to Corporate Grammar. All my friends from St Kilda Primary were going to Christian Brothers College or Elwood College and I really wanted to go to local high school. But um, mum and dad sent me to Corporate Grammar. And uh, mum and dad went away one weekend. We painted the house and they were supposed to stay at Chris Charleston's house. Instead, um, we all went back to my house because we had a free house. In year seven, we stayed at mum and dad's place. And with paint fumes, sat in the front room and did what sort of 13, 14 year olds do. But that Sunday when Peter Jones, um, a certain member of our extended family, um, came over and just asked if mum and dad was home and he wasn't. Um, as every other time, I invited Peter in for a cup of tea, had a chat. Peter was a man that suffered from schizophrenia. Um, when Peter left the house, uh, I realised none of my friends in the front room had moved. And really good friends of mine, that some of them are still really good friends, but from Brighton, San Sandringham, Hampton, were shocked. What is this man doing in your house? And then a fight erupted with uh, another guy literally outside our house in St Kilda. And I walked out and asked if Peter was okay and they walked away. And it was just to realise that, you know, four or five train stations away that uh, these friends of mine had gone up in a very different upbringing. And so those values of 
justice, equality and fairness to anyone in society, irrespective of your background, was something that um, has remained with me. And Tim, can I ask you what has happened in your life that has most challenged that set of values and your worldview? Um, the presence, the enduring, stubborn presence of human malevolence and uh, greed is what challenges me. Um, it runs through every human heart. It's not black hats and white hats, you know, I'm white hat and they're their black hats. Greed and fear and then the ability to stand on others' shoulders, use them to get ahead is within me but it's within every human and when you're in a world where there is enough for all of us, there is the opportunity to deal with profound inequality and disadvantage but fear and greed means we don't. Um, that really continues to disturb me. Uh, my, my question, I was joking a little bit earlier about justice and sharing a bedroom with Peter, but it is my question. It's why is the architecture of the world this way? That some get far more than they need and some miss out altogether. Does it have to be that way? Is poverty natural or is it created? And I have a view that it is created. And a view that if we can deal with that fear within all of us and greed and find solutions, it isn't just a helping thing. We actually find ourselves. We become truly human. And, you know, the world vision work isn't largely about hardware of wells and schools. It's actually software. It's changing attitudes in the brain, in the heart, overcoming difference. And profoundly, it's about the mystery of human encounter and solidarity and deep respect and friendship, as Elliot was saying for a, a Peter Jones, who otherwise is just a category for fear. So um, the fact that humans still, with that malevolence, don't move toward that is, is one of the greatest challenges for me. Mm. And is there, do you have an experience where that's been kind of writ large in your life that's made you, that's made it hard to, to keep doing what you've done all your life? Yeah, the, the, the paradox of my life is that I am most alive when I'm in the poorest communities um, because you still see in poverty, which I'll never romanticise, levels of sharing, solidarity, dance, care, commitment that when you come back to Australia where we've solved, you know, the problem of supply, how many digital screen TVs does a family home need and mobile phones does a 16-year-old need and yet there's epidemics of depression, youth suicide, there is ice plagues and you go, how come you feel more alive where actually they still haven't had a chance and you've got to overcome poverty and here where you know, we largely want for nothing. There is this profound loss of community purpose. So that, that always challenges me. Um, I could tell lots of personal stories, written lots of books about that, but that's the great paradox for my, my life. Mm. Elliot, what's challenged your values and worldview most? Look, I'm, I wouldn't say a lot yet. Um, and I'm happy about that, only tipped over 30 recently, but I'd, I'd say what's um, reinforced it more is uh, a growing awakening and appetite of young people. And, um, you know, I admittedly started that and as an auditor at PwC. It's probably the worst auditor in PwC's history. I, I didn't last long. But um, stepping outside of that and walking into a sphere of this not-for-profit sector eight years ago, and there's only a few youth-run, youth-led organisations prior to FYA really coming to it, its existence and power um, without social traders, um, all these incubators and school social entrepreneurs and everything. Um, we were a crazy group of friends trying to do something on the side. Um, but now seeing the ecosystem develop and be reinforced and be given so much energy in life and just a conversation on the way here with the group that is now looking at you know, millions of dollars to really amplify and express um, and really accelerate the, the, this youth-driven movement in this country. It's really powerful. So it's really reinforcing the fact that a traditional mindset of finishing university, going into work, working for 35 years, earning enough money to do good, 
is totally being flipped around. And programs like the Compass and universities right around the world that are now stepping up and realising that change of attitude and desire um, of young people that do not want to necessarily work at the big four banks or accounting firms or legal firms, um, who really want to step into an organisation with a very strong DNA uh, that's socially driven and motivated, um, reinforces this value that I, I grew up with, with the benefit of a, a father like dad, but also people that didn't have that type of values growing up, they're realising that they don't want to work for an organisation that doesn't get their values. Mm. Um, Tim, I'm really, I, mean, I guess I want to get to some of the kind of please discuss questions um, to the topic of tonight, but I think it's, you know, it's important to know where both of you are coming from in, in thinking about these. But, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of conversation in the world about welfare and aid and development in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and a lot of the discussion's been about has it done more harm than good? Does it destroy people's self-determination and independence? What is, what is your thinking today about that really substantial and significant question in the world about welfare aid and development? You know, welfare that's uh, passive is destructive. Noel Pearson, I think, has got that absolutely right. Um, thankfully, and there's good and bad development, thankfully, World Vision's model, and I should say over 60 years we've made every mistake there is to make <laughs> and thankfully learned uh, is we will stay no longer than 15 years in communities and right at the start we'll say you know we're going to leave you know the money's going to stop you know this is a hand up not a handout and we will <coughs> create businesses yes we'll do the health education clean water but we'll say without microfinance without economic development uh, that gives you a lift up, it's going to be welfare. So very, don't trust development organisations that don't, that don't plan their exit on the day they enter. <laughs> That's, I think, the key to good development. Um, the most powerful program, which is the software I was talking about in the brain, not just hardware, is called Citizens Voice in Action. So I've just come from Uganda, uh, there in the area we're working up near the South Sudanese border, flooded with South Sudanese because of the war. We're doing our usual health, water, all of that. We, we do all of those sectors to lift communities to sustainability. There are great organisations that are very single focused and donors like that. They go, they just do health they report on how many people they helped, uh, or they just build houses, and you can show your donor, yep, the money got there, we sent 100 houses, here are the pictures, or this many people treated for health. Our problem with that, though that's great, is you might have built 100 houses, but the water supply is still polluted, the HIV rate's still raging, you're not getting better agricultural yield, there aren't any businesses set up, but you've got 100 houses. So we say we will work across all the sectors. Citizens Voice in Action is the software that links them all. It says if they have said we want a health centre, we'll go. Who should build it? Oh, it should be our government. Well, why do you need World Vision? Who knows where the health budget went? Palaces, military, Swiss bank accounts. So we'll say, OK, here's the deal. We'll build the health centre. On this condition, you form a citizen's voice in action group. You're a citizen with a voice. And then it will teach you, train you, or get the government manuals to see how much was in the health budget and how much was allocated to your region. In this case, it was northern Uganda. We'll teach you the skills to track where those dollars went or didn't go. And we'll teach you the skills when you know to organise politically and put the asset back on government. Why? Because when we leave in 15 years, who's going to pay the nurses? Who's going to put the medicines in the health clinic? Well, this visit, I came back and I'd been at the Citizens Voice in Action party. These illiterate, they are illiterate farmers, dancing, about 50, 60 of them. And I tried to dance, but being white, you don't move right. You know, <laughs> Uh, it's a bit like it's rigor mortis and everybody, no, and um, I said, what are we celebrating? They tracked the money. They'd actually found out it was local 
politicians who for eight years had been pocketing the money for the health centre. They'd organised, they'd removed them. And the pride in their faces that they had done this. Now, that's why you can move out. That's why it's good development, because this is software. This is skills, this is empowerment, and this is working across all, all the sectors. So you're right, if it's just welfare, it's a tap that once it's turned off, there's not much to show for all that's run. Mm. Elliot, what are, you, what are you and your generation doing differently to that? Or are you just doing the same thing in a kind of a sexy kind of way, with a bit more fundraising? <laughs> I'm a star more, like A few more drinks. <laughs> yeah. um, look, there is obviously a, a different approach with fundraising. You know, we're seeing such an avalanche of um, new technologies available to young people to launch initiatives. Um, and importantly, be able to attract and engage um, young people in a very different way. And Dad's well aware that a lot of the people that work at Wiregap or volunteer or our interns probably wouldn't have the same opportunities at uh, World Vision and uh, maybe not be attracted to the same level of uh, programs. So there's that side of things, but I think what's important to mention is that um, a lot of the young organisations, and speaking specifically around international development, maybe the same within welfare uh, agencies too, a lot of the organisations that do try their hand at development usually get it wrong. And we're one of them. And so when we went full steam ahead and thought, you know, oh, we can do some fundraising, run parties, speak to donors, launch businesses um, and build out all these enterprises to enable us to have funds to spend in the field, um, we went to Africa. We built schools, we ran church training programs, ran youth leadership programs, and four years later scratched our head and said, why on earth are we doing this? And how much we'd learned in the process was a bit of an existential question around why do we exist? What benefit is it that we have a YGAP school that's funded uh, for our donors to be happy to a vision dinner we run annually? And so it enabled us to go a bit deeper and ask that question of, well, what's our real passion and what are we good at? Is it a Habitat for Humanity, a World Vision, Tier Australia, Care Australia that's better to spend donors' funds and not be us? Um, you know, Thank You is a great example. They don't do any development work. They fundraise in an innovative way, but they do not do any development work. They partner with World Vision and three or four other agencies to deliver the programs. And so we had that question around, do we want to just focus on our fundraising, movement building, and enable other agencies to deliver uh, the provision of services? Um, for us, it led to a, a discovery around entrepreneurship and how passionate we were, not only using entrepreneurship as a tool for fundraising, but really using entrepreneurship as a tool to solve some of the world's biggest problems. And that led to a, a number of great conversations, uh, which included one with Spark International, a group based in Sydney, uh, which two years later uh, eventuated in a merger and bringing Daniel and a group of other independent board members onto our team to uh, facilitate this merger between two organisations. One that was really good at fundraising and movement building, the other that had four years of tested experience at finding and supporting local international entrepreneurs. And so for us, it's now very specified around how do we really back locals? How do we stay well out of it? And it confuses DFAT when we apply for certain uh, levels of funding, not just funding, but applications around DGR because they don't get their head around a school in Africa doesn't have a restrained flag or a up emblem. Um, our programs are centralised around a four-step process of, of finding and backing local entrepreneurs with real talent in some of the world's toughest communities across Africa, Asia, and a program we have here in Australia too. And we're not part of the solution. We're a very small piece of that journey to accelerate some of the best young people with great ideas to end problems in their own communities. And so I think young people are accessing the tools of technology, movement building, and others to not only fundraise, but now find innovative solutions. And I think Dad's well aware and appreciates that there's room for different size organisations. Stuff that we do in townships, in slums, in communities that in urban programs that World Vision may not be able to do. Um, but knowing that if we're not doing it right on certain other levels, to be very honest about that too. And we had conversations with our donors that we're making this pivot because we're not the best in the world at building schools. And that although it's been great to experience and experiment with it, we have to move in a different direction if we're going to be a part of the solution of ending poverty in our lifetime. Mm. On to poverty, but also more broadly, I'm interested in what you think the defining issues of our lifetime, I mean, what will we be measured by in generations to come? So I, I think for the next decade there's three issues we're going to be talking about. The first is climate change, and uh, if I can be a bit 
bit political before the budget. We're clearly going to have a, another scare campaign that Australia can't have ambitious targets because our electricity bills might go up and we'll be poorer. Well, let me tell you, if we don't deal with climate change, we all will be poorer. Um, the second is refugees. Uh, at the moment, Syrian refugees flooding, particularly uh, Europe, are going to be changing governments. It's the profound rise of uh, the nationalistic ultra-right parties. Um, and the only response is to build walls and maybe Brexit. And in a world that's globalising, where all our problems are global, climate change, terror, even banking, internet monetary crises, refugees, we are retribalizing. We're building walls. We're pulling up draw bridges. Uh, we're thinking national governments can pull levers because they'll tell us, vote for us, and we'll do this. National governments don't know anymore have the levers to pull. It's only if we actually act together that we can deal with it. The refugee crisis in Syria is huge and it's a terrible blight on all of us that this war couldn't have gone on for more than 12 months without the West and its money and weapons back in Saudi Arabia. That's really fighting for control with Iran. And Iran and Russia have backed Assad. Um, and each has had the illusion their side can win. So the money and the weapons have just kept funneling a, wall, a war that's a stalemate. And the refugee crisis is overwhelming us. That refugee crisis will look tiny compared to the next blip that's going to come from Africa. If you look at the demographic time bomb in a number of African countries, and if, because we've cut aid, smashed aid here in Australia, if you don't give autonomy and hope and skills to stay, people are coming our way. So that's the second big issue, and again, that refugee issue is going to be a scare campaign. We cannot be generous with 850 people on Manus Island because we have a hysteria that there might be one boat that starts again. We can't even let 250 of these people in mental torture go to New Zealand. It's just a classic fear campaign we're going to go into. That's both sides of politics, by the way. Labor and the Coalition are one of them. Um, the third issue is inequality. Uh, 61 individuals now own the wealth of 3.5 billion people, the bottom 3.5. And the dislodging between productivity, innovation if you like, productivity and jobs is actually very worrying. There's fantastic fortunes being made by the 1%, but whenever there's been productivity and innovation in the past, it's usually led to job explosion. That's been unhinged. You were getting productivity and innovation without it actually creating jobs. And that particularly blows out inequality. Uh, free markets find this really profoundly difficult to work with. Um, so those, those three issues, uh, I think climate change, refugees and inequality are, are really our agenda for the next decade. Mm. Elliot, for your generation, what are they talking about? I'm not sure they're talking issues. about this, but it, slightly contrary to my last point, was um, is something that I'm probably a bit worried about, and that's the implications of technology. And I, I'm an advocate for it because of the ability it has to help fundraise and find solutions to, to some of the world's biggest problems. But I'm also very fearful of where technology is going to lead us. And you know, in my lifetime, you know, growing up in a society where we didn't have mobile phones, we didn't have iPads, iPods, Mac books and everything in between. We spent time playing in parks, we spent time jumping backyards to kick the footy. And this addiction to having a device 20 centimetres from your face for hours each and every day. And there's probably even a few people in this room that haven't checked their phone in the past half an hour. And I'm really worried about the effect of that. The implications around isolation, loneliness, um, the distance we have from individuals, that loss of human condition, that ability to jump on a train or in an elevator and talk to someone and strike a conversation with a perfect stranger because we have an automated excuse not to by pulling out your phone and pretending you're on the phone. And it's going to continue this perpetuation of mental illness. And 
the more socially connected we are online, the more disconnected we are offline. And I, I, I probably just second that to Dad's points are very geopolitical, large, international ones that we do face, and they're existential questions around terror and climate change, but there's also human spirit that's being challenged by technology and our addiction to it. So I don't know how many young people are talking about it. Um, there's certainly many benefits, and I do say from mine that I'm an advocate for technology in many respects, but I, I do fear where this is leading us um, as, a, as, a, as a race, really, more than anything else, and as a, as a humankind. So there's implications behind that uh, screen you're now typing into. That kind of leads me on to my next question to both of you, which is how do people find their purpose and their why? How do you, what is your advice to people? How so, you find, uh, you, you find it by reading my next book that's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Late self-promotion. In August. <laughs> oh, no, You've got enough um, books already. What is it? What's the uh, It's called Faith. Um, uh, you, and it's called Faith because whether you're religious or not, you actually have to rest on ground to find purpose that you can't prove is empirically true. How do you empirically prove love and trust and a whole lot of things? It is a, a step of faith. Um, I uh, you know, wrote this uh, because I think we've had the wrong question. The, the question normally asked is how do I find happiness? And I think happiness is a byproduct of actually purpose. I think purpose is the right question. Uh, rather than how do I get happiness, it's how do I give? How do I serve? What, what is my deeper sense of calling that if I don't do it, I'm going to be poorer and the world's going to be poorer? And I think that sense of purpose is the intersection between where your bliss and the world's need meets. It might be your music, your art, it might be your mentoring, it might be your ability to run businesses and to, along the way, solve social problems, not just for-profit businesses, but shared value businesses. But I, I think that is uh, profoundly imp important and happiness is a little bit of a byproduct. Now, the final thing I'd say is, it is so fundamentally important to have these deeper conversations because uh, um, I'm quite struck by you know, Carl Jung, who I quote, saying, no one I treated, father of psychotherapy, really ever got well without their soul being healed. That's the word he used. He talked about soul sickness. Now that was a language really about loss of purpose that sense that I, uh, I'm not nurturing the deepest, truest part of who I am. Um, and in this book, I'll just finish with this, I quote um, Viktor Frankl, who uh, survived uh, Auschwitz, and he was a psychiatrist, and his therapy was called purpose therapy, logotherapy, purpose therapy. And uh, he said, those few of us who survived Auschwitz, you know, terrified, asking the question, will we survive? He said, when we survived, we had a much more terrifying and difficult question. It was, survived for what? What's actually our purpose? And it can be really difficult. That's why I think it's a soul process to work this out, but it's, it's the right question. And I don't have the answer, Jen, but it's the right question. Elliot, how do you keep growing emotionally, spiritually, intellectually? What's your path? Because you're not a reverend like your father. He has a no, clear no, path no and a clear belief system that drives that, which is fantastic. How do you yeah. nurture and grow? Uh, look, it's, it's a great question and, and probably it took a burnout to realise that I wasn't going to find it just through work. And, um, you know, after seven years of running four pace with an organisation, five years of volunteering and working full-time and building it on the side and two, two and a half years of full-time work, I completely burnt out and probably didn't tell anyone uh, except Dad's wife who happens to be my mother. And <laughs> I... I'm glad, I'm glad you're 
is very quick, isn't Just to it? get it on the record. Uh, and so that, that burnout led me to realise that, you know, just because I was busy wasn't meaning that I was feel, feeling my purpose. Um, waking up early in the morning, racing to breakfast, having lunch meetings, having meetings four, four or five nights a week, um, getting home late and, and feeling a sense of achievement because I'd worked 15, 16 hours. And um, yeah, the past sort of six to 12 months has been uh, an amazing experience to realise it's not selfish to, to look after yourself. And uh, spending a lot more time on my own and, and pushing some friendships away in a good way, but uh, enjoying things that I want to be doing. Uh, and that involves being very connected to a local footy club, you know, meaning I can get out of, at, uh, out of work at 4.35 if I need to, to get to football training. Uh, enjoy that sense of community with guys on a footy field where I can't be checking my phone or checking emails. Um, it means, uh, you know, spending more time writing and, and doing other things that are artistic that are less related to work. Uh, and it also means conversation I'm having with Daniel around further study. You know, I, I really enjoy my job and really enjoy what I'm doing, but I actually love being here at an institution like Melbourne University because I feel there's certain parts of my world that I'm, where I'm not learning. Uh, so I think that's a, a great question for a lot of young people, that the sense of purpose isn't just in your job. It isn't just finding a career and knowing that ticks a box, but it's um, all-encompassing of the spirit of the community, uh, your relationships at home with friends, and of course your work's a part of that too. I actually heard this morning um, from a housemate who's heavily involved in the art of living, who said, um, we, so we tend to base our spiritual life or our personal life, however you want to find it, around our work life, when instead we should base our work life around our spiritual and or personal life. And I thought that was really fitting that um, we can contextualise the self and look after the self to that few minutes a day before you go to bed or when you wake up, as opposed to saying, now this is something I want to do throughout the day. And whether it's mindfulness, meditation, spirituality, however you find that sense of belonging within yourself is important. And I'm only really discovering that now. Mm. Oh, I've got so many more questions, but I have to open it up to the floor. So um, I think we've got some people with mics. Before we go to the floor and kind of you get to ask your questions, um, turn to the person next to you and just say hi, introduce yourself, ask them about their purpose, even if it's just about being here. <laughs> towards it. 
Um, I think it's exciting. I think it's a, it's a great new medium that we can start building our businesses that have social DNAs and values. Um, but I think it really cannot substitute away from charity and traditional charity and the work that organisations do, like World Vision. Um, we obviously have a, a bit of an addiction to it. We've launched four social enterprises and um, not all successful. Um, but in the process of doing so, it generates a lot of our revenue, but not a lot of our profit. And our returns are really much better for our campaigns and our, our traditional uh, philanthropy. And so um, we still we use it as a key pillar. It's a great tool to engage people and run restaurants and cafes and apparel businesses, which we do. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we were really strict about our model, our best money comes from, I know with individuals, trust foundations and our camp, two national fundraising campaigns. Um, but at the same time, I think it's a really exciting space that um, it's giving MBA students at Melbourne University, Monash Deacon, and around the world this new vision and insight around, I can run a business um, in some way provide a, a financial return, but also have social value in the, purpose, in the process of running that business. And uh, of course, it's met with different ways. You can have a, a social return in the process of running a business, and Street's a great example of that. You employ disadvantaged youth in the process of making coffees in all their cafes. Or you can run it in the profit, or the other side is um, owning a social enterprise and using the profits to distribute into good causes. Um, so to see it as a, a new sort of platform, uh, a new tool, um, I think everyone's getting a little bit too excited about it. I think the um, lever that I put on it is just to make sure that um, emerging entrepreneurs know at the end of the day that you're still running a business. And you know, 9 out of 10 uh, small businesses in the sector usually fail in the first 12 months. So to be very careful that just launching a social enterprise doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Um, and some of your models uh, might be better off traditional plans to be, or a hybrid model. Uh, so it's, yeah, I think a lot of it's born out of Muhammad Yunus, uh, obviously the godfather of uh, microfinance, but also social business. But I think you'd be concerned about the direction it's now heading, especially with the free enterprise arm. In the US, the west coast of the US, of, you know, a social enterprise over there is a, an organisation that makes its shareholder money. But you know, the Tom's model is a perfect example. Sold to, to Bank Capital for 325 million, 50% of the equity. And that's making an enormous return for individuals, Blake and other members of his team but there's social value in the process of running the business. Well, the UK model is a bit more driven by government. Uh, there's a lot of great funds available in the big society and other government-led initiatives. Um, I really like how Australia is evolving in it, sort of taking the best of both models. Uh, and we're premature, but we're also very mature in many other ways. Um, so it's a new asset class, if you like. Uh, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of energy. Um, it's given young people a, a, a real um, excitement, but it also is forcing traditional charities to think differently about their fundraising models. Um, and philanthropists that are also now saying, well, is a different way to invest my philanthropic capital. I might uh, just add, philosophically, I think the difference between old and new is this word purpose. Um, I, for a long time now, have been saying, why do we in the not-for-profit sector call ourselves, define ourselves negatively? We're the for-purpose sector, as if profit is dirty. Well, we depend on people to make profit and give to, to what I like to call, the charity is the old uh, English word for love. I like to call this the love sector. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as Elliot said, there will always be a place for that. We, we, we should never just say there's no place for charity and love. Um, there are lots of landlocked countries with uh, nasty neighbours who don't have natural resources for whom aid is lifting them out of poverty and that is humanitarian love. I think for a uh, purpose is the right word for a for-profit. So for-profits only define themselves as for-profit. And of course the great pressure has been that they still are getting their scorecards, their homework marked by analysts on very short-term turnarounds. But more and more for-profits, because they have CEOs, the age of, like the audience tonight, who are sensitive to indigenous issues and environmental issues and refugees. More and more for-profits are going. A deeper purpose isn't just a profit. It's also if we can make a profit and help solve social problems. That's a deeper purpose. That's actually, I think, the shared value idea. So I think purpose is the, 
is the shift between old and new. Thank you. Another, we've got a couple of questions at the back and one over here to the left. Hi, um, I work for St Kilda Gatehouse and a little bit of context to my question for you, Elliot. Um, we work with young women, 12 to 25, who are involved or experiencing sexual exploitation. So I really appreciated your balance of appreciation for technology and also the, the challenges that that produces for our society. And my question is, how do you vision being part of the solution um, within that problem? Of sexual exploitation? Of the social isolation and the technology and um, what Y Gap's about. Yeah, well, look, uh, it's definitely a question outside of Y Gap's realm. Um, we're an organisation focused on the alleviation of poverty. Um, but it's a, it's a tough one. I think honest conversations with young children um, partly starts with parenting. And um, although Jan made it very obvious and clear that I'm not a parent myself, um, it's, you know, the, the shortcomings of a parent potentially is this easy solution to looking after a child by giving them a techni techni uh, technical device and allowing them to sit in their room or sit on an airplane and, and shut up for hours because they'll be distracted uh, instead of engaging in conversations, much like Dad's upbringing, around asking questions. How was their day? Why was their day good? What did they learn? Um, and that simple ability to connect with children and ensure that technology is available and it's there for its use, but doesn't replace the connection between parents, children, and then children's relationships with others. There's one at the back and one here, just seeing you. And do you want to take that mic up the back there too? Great. Um, so the, the title of the talk today is Social Impact, and there's a lot of professionals in the room who could have their human capital being put towards two aspects of, of impact. One being developing a wealth that they can then donate to organisations like your own or giving their human capital to organisations like your own. Peter Singer talks about the effective altruist and the intersection between what you can do versus what you can give. Where do you guys see that going in the future? Yeah, we are often going in a binary way when I think it should be both hands. So part of the value system in my family, uh, to answer about, um, Jan's first question, was my parents, teachers, so not hugely well paid, always gave away 10% of their income. Always. And uh, that's what my wife and I have practised. Now, you might, if you do the survey, discover this is a bit unusual. On average, Australian donations over a year is about $200. Peter Singer makes an argument for the graduated type. He says it doesn't need to be 10%, it could be 1% and you can afford it. And you can save a life in Africa, as you would definitely try and save a life of a child here if you could. Why is the ethic dissolved if you actually have the power still to save that life through giving. That's one of Peter Singer's big arguments. So I think he's absolutely spot on with that ethic around giving. I equally think that the purpose meaning question that we were trying to answer before goes to human capital. Where is the skills and gifts that I have aligned in a way that actually brings both joy to me and intersects with need. That's how I was defining this sense of calling. And I am troubled, and Daniel, I thought, put it beautifully, although you're much younger than the, the people I usually hear say, say this, but I am troubled by the number of people who say I've been successful in business, they're usually 50 and above. It can't be that hard to do charity. So I'm just going to set up a foundation and I'll show all those charities how hopeless they are because I'm successful. And Daniel's very humble, but he's right. They mostly fall on their, feet, on their face. This sense of arrogance and hubris of human capital because solving social problems really does require profound respect for others, for dignity, for time to enter into a relationship. If you actually boil down what development means, whether it's with the poor or even here, good development actually means relationship. 
That's where we get terms like human capital and trust, uh, uh, social capital, trust, human capital. It's actually about that. And you've got to enter into that. If I had time, I'd talk about how we know that Indigenous Australia, we're not closing the gap despite $24 billion going in for less than 500,000 Indigenous in Australia. Total global aid for the 2 billion people in absolute poverty is only $100 billion. We're spending $24 billion on less than 500,000 here. And if you look at, this is my view, the reason, we have rotating doors, state and federal departments, NGOs doing short-term work in remote Indigenous communities where there is no long-term development of relationship, mutual respect, real friendship, learning the language, staying. Jig along, and World Vision's now bringing a development approach saying we will not do service delivery, we're in a number of communities. Jig along where we are, 350 Indigenous in community, over 105 different organisations and agencies working. This is mad. This is complete, you know, no wonder when Indigenous here, another Land Rover coming down the track from out of Newman, they decide to go hunting and fishing. They don't want to be consulted with again. They know it's going to be a quick turnaround. And these programs are really expensive. It's people who stay and learn the language and invest. So even if you've been very successful in business, unless you're prepared with your human capital to actually enter into that full engagement of staying with the development issue, which is relationship, it can be a bit too short term. That, that would be my answer. Take a question up the back, yeah. Um, Elliot, thank you for raising the notion of having enough time to play, to work, and then to just be. Um, I was really glad to hear you bring up the concept of having enough time for just you and a bit of recuperation and rejuvenation. Um, you spoke about you have a few friends that have been long-term friends or school friends that are now um, business partners or maybe just friends. Um, for the both of you, I'm wondering how you balance the notion of being a friend, being a business partner, when they're both and if they are always one or the other. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I've managed to get through eight years of friendships and business relationships. Um, I think the best honest answer is it's not always easy. Um, you always start with the right intentions, um, but a lot of challenges will come in your way. And, you know, YGAP was formed out of a group of ten friends that wanted to volunteer in Africa, and it's now in a very different part. Um, but the, essentially the three co-founders that made it possible are still very much active and engaged. Um, and it's taken a lot of honesty to get to where we are, and uh, hardship, and, and very confronting conversations. And you know, different points have all been employed, and different points we all haven't been employed. And um, but I think what cuts beyond uh, the business relationship is the friendship. And it might be just like a marriage, where you develop that friendship first and foremost, and ensure that that's the undercurrent beyond the business relationship. Uh, so it's not easy, and I know a lot of these programs, um, especially at universities, are built on. Friends, meeting, developing social ideas together, forming partnerships, getting some level of funding, growing their ventures, trying to be a unicorn and selling out in the first two years and making money, having a social impact. Uh, but it's often got to be based on a really strong uh, foundation. And uh, I think the, the most evident thing to know and appreciate is that it will be very difficult and very revealing and confronting and frustrating. And no one in business and not-for-profit industry is still a business. You're still entering into relationships and signing agreements and managing money and effectively you're just spending your profit on a very different thing. You will be confronted and challenged. And so I've been lucky enough to be supported by really great friends in the journey who have many times lowered egos and really come to back to the central point of why do we exist. And that's a foundational reason to support people who are living in absolute poverty. Yeah, i just add that you have to separate skills and business focus from human dignity, worth, friendship, which if the skills don't match and you have to let people go, we've had to let nearly 100 staff go at World Vision in the last six months. Uh, the dollar 
dropping by 30% over the last 18 months, we have to program in American dollars, but we raise in Australian dollars. So you raise your money and you've lost 20, 30% even after you've hedged. And our staff in the field, wherever we are, we're a local organisation, shouldn't feel the cost of that. And it's been incredibly painful because a whole lot of these people are passionate, uh, committed, fantastically skilled. It's not their fault the dollar dropped. And to actually affirm this deeper purpose and dignity, but this isn't going to stop friendship, uh, judge your worth. It's really tricky, but I think it is possible. Mm. The question over here. Thank you for your three. Sorry, sharing your values today. Um, I'm a youth worker. I've been a youth worker for nine years. Um, and my question is um, directed to Tim. I, since I've been in youth work and I've left so many um, organisations, which I wouldn't name, uh, just out of this, all the frustrations that you guys talked about, um, I feel the basic issue is value-based education. So we are constantly manufacturing young people be ready for the job that may not exist in 10 years. So you have travelled around the world and looked at different education systems maybe. The first question is, are there any value-based education system around? And if so, are they working? Or Australia, how far are we in terms of value-based education system? Mm. Um, so I really... I think it's a great question that I won't adequately answer because I'm not an educationalist per se. Uh, I, I'll say two things. Firstly, you said you've left many organisations. I, I just want to put this out there uh, because we're seeing a whole flowering of lots of organisations with fantastic motives to make a difference. Let me say, it is actually really hard to do good. People think it can't be that hard, and I've got goodwill, and I'll go with this organisation. It is actually really hard to do good. There are so many unintended consequences, and because of funding and per programs, and let's be honest, our need to be needed. When we go to do good, it's often about our need to be needed. We come with agendas, and we impose them. And those agendas are power structures that you know, uh, manipulative at times. So, when we talk about values-based education, you know, the extraordinary thing, they vary from culture to culture, because values, this is a mystery for us, values just don't materialise out of nowhere. In most of the world, values are religiously driven. Uh, secular Australia still finds this a bit in incomprehensible. But most of the world finds the notion of secular incomprehensible. They'll go, secular? How do you name a child? How do you have a wedding? If you're secular, they'll say, that, that means you don't have values. By the way, indigenous, particularly uh, more traditional indigenous, will have the same view. Secular. How, this is a sort of disconnection from the mystery Whatever God, God's connection to land is. How? This makes no sense. So, as soon as you talk about values-based education, you, you are effectively talking about values that are connected to something transcendent, something spiritual, something deeper. Uh, trying to do it in a technocratic way. Always as, you know, like the flowers. They look nice, but they're actually cut off from the soil and they're dying. Unless they're still being nurtured by that culture, faith, spirituality and clarifying the values because a lot of those religions have values that don't treat women very well. And that's why I mean that development work is actually more software. It's modelling through relationship where World Vision works. Men valuing their wives and saying it's never acceptable to hit them or pull their daughter out of school and leave their son in school. Because the daughter, why would you waste education on her? She's only going to marry another family. You'll get a few cows for her if you're in Africa. 
but she'll only bring value with an education to that family, so why would I pay? Those attitudes are software, and you actually have to reach into their spiritual faith traditions and tweak them. One of the most exciting things World Vision does, Channels of Hope, is in Christian nations we use the Bible to, which is their source of authority, to break down patriarchy, male headship, male dominance. We are now doing this in Afghanistan, in Muslim countries, through uh, West Africa. Afghanistan, we've taken the Quran, we've trained 380 mullahs and 1,800 community Muslim leaders in the Quran, in attitudes, what the Quran says, pulling our text toward women. And that might you know, be interesting for you to hear. That's their values structure. Trying to, to do it with a secular view, you know, here read Germain Greer or Gloria Stone. You know, impossible. So the, the, the answer I'm giving, it's got to have real connection values. They, they, it's got to connect to something that is plausible and is the energy zone out of which they come. Does that make sense? Yeah. Tim, can I ask you a follow-up question about what, what is it to, I mean, what would you now do differently if you were starting today? Um, in fact, you might want to tell Elliot this. <laughs> what, as a social sector leader, you know, in this current environment, in the world in which we are in, what would you do differently today? What, what would you go out with and what would you lead with and what are the attributes that you would take? What, did you, yeah. what would you do so differently? I, the first thing I, I would say is um, we are making huge progress. Uh, keep hope alive. So... You know, it might come as a shock to you that Ben Chifley, who was a Labour Party icon, you know that name? He ran his campaign when he got elected to Parliament in the 1930s on heroes, not dagos. That was his slogan. Italians, dagos, were a fear. This wide Australia policy and race being this sense of profound difference, we actually are making progress. So first thing is, starting out today, to keep hope alive. When it comes to development, when I started at World Vision, it was 30,000 kids under the age of five dying every day of preventable disease, dirty water, not having access to uh, uh, enough calories to survive. Today, less than 15,000 kids died. So in 13 years, we're making huge progress. So I would start with this wonderful quote of Martin Luther King's, the arc of history moves slowly, but it moves toward justice. Now, Martin Luther King lost his life fighting impossible civil rights battles, but I, I would say that because the most important value is to actually recognise, get on the right side of justice and history, and don't think it's all about you. You're not the Messiah, and... You have a contribution to make on that right side of history. That would be my message. And Elliot, the rookie errors, you've been in the game a few years, so hashtag learning, you know, failing and simultaneously learning. What are the rookie errors? What would you think, tell people not to do I, as a new social yeah, sector leader? Yeah, absolutely. I, I spoke with you, Jan Owen, last week in Sydney. I think so. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just repeat that. <laughs> Uh, you know, a, a well-known large Australian corporation that's just launched an accelerator. Another one joins the flock, and it was interesting to have that conversation around um, this huge movement towards um, more and more young people jumping out of schools, universities, uh, or careers to, to start something. Um, and part of my advice to the eleven selected entrepreneurs to go through this program with access to three hundred thousand dollars at the end was. It was a, I felt, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jan, but the, the emphasis was on the six people that were going to get access to the $300,000. There was such an emphasis on those six people who get $50,000 each and how great they've been, what their ventures would do. And with the CEO and the chairman on the panel with us, I stopped and said, why, why haven't we got this wrong? Why wouldn't we celebrate the five that fail first? Because those five are going to go on and do most transformational and, and hypothetically even better things because they'll learn what mistakes they made, they'll go into new ventures, they may even pivot in the direction they're working on. They may even join others and realise that their messiah complex was wrong. And I think it's 
ties in with this national rhetoric that we've got around this tall poppy syndrome that we have to succeed and we measure on our success and everyone will ask you about your successes rather than what the West Coast of America does really well um, when you enter many conversations to get investment at a seed level or from a venture capital firm. One of the first questions you'll be asked in the Silicon Valley is, how many times have you failed? And you'll have to actually list how many times you've failed because a lot of venture capital firms won't invest in entrepreneurs that haven't failed because they don't believe you've gone and learnt the lessons yet and they want you to go out and fail before you get any level of decent investment. And so I, yeah, I, we've failed a number of times. We launched a biodegradable water bottle before Thank You existed. That was the best thing in the market. Cost of, <laughs> cost of production was too high. A joint venture we did with a group in Sydney. Um, we've had volunteers' lives, be, lives being threatened in Ghana at a very hostile situation, four in the morning. Our partnership manager and I, sorry, our project manager and I are sitting there answering calls with a, a, a situation where 12 of our volunteers could have been killed on the spot. Uh, it was a negotiation of release of some children in bonded labour. Um, we've failed in education um, schools that we've tried to build and been threatened by locals in Malawi. Um, and the, the hardest part, as was asked earlier, about these relationships we've had, these, these knock of heads we've had when you do get distracted by your mission and you end up fighting with the people you love. Uh, so there's a lot of lessons to learn, but I, I, I'd say the number one is an appreciation of making mistakes and, and learning from them and picking yourself up. And what I also mentioned last week was um, to just think before you launch the venture, is there anyone else doing the same thing? We have 600,000 registered not-for-profits in this country, and Dad's been very vocal about this, um, up to 60,000 that are materially objective and actively fundraising. So 60,000 groups that are competing for your dollars consumer dollars, governments, trust foundations, and more and more young people that are starting things uh, without really foresight of who's already doing stuff in that space. And we end up competing and having duplicate resources and more headaches and more competition. Um, and I think the UK does it really well around a register that before you register a not-for-profit or a social enterprise, you have to go through the register and prove that no one else in the UK is doing what you're doing and solving that social problem. I think it's a really good place to start to say, is there anyone else I can work with to halve my headaches and to accelerate the work and ensure the people I'm trying to support have access to a better outcome? Tim, knowing what we know about everything today and about apprenticing the problem and evidence and data, is it actually morally acceptable to fail whilst practising your new social impact leadership craft on real people's lives? Yeah, this is a, a very profound ethical question. <laughs> um, I agree with Elliot. I had a boss when I started out as a young lawyer who said, uh, have a go. There's no mistake that we can't probably rectify. And actually, for my personality, that was terrific learning because most of us know it's not through our successes that we grow. It's almost always our failures. Then you add the complication of your question, but if that actually causes distress and sets people's lives back, uh, what's this about? You know, uh, your growth, but people, people are not guinea pigs. Um, so I think the sorts of thinking and ethical restraint around doing good, as I said, because it is hard to do, uh, has developed a body of ethics. I am really pleased that we've got a, a Charities Commission now in Australia, which Tony Abbott and Kevin Andrews and, by the way, Cardinal Pell tried to kill and didn't want transparency, but we've got it. And that transparency uh, is actually a causing not-for-profits to go, we actually cannot see ourselves just as competitors. If we're really ethically focused on the social problems, we've got to be learning from each other, cooperating with each other, combining with each other, because otherwise it is about us. And we're experimenting on others. So um, it's an ethical question that I don't think we'll ever answer. Uh, but it's, it's why I said about love. You know, at the end of the day, even when you make mistakes with people, if they sense you love them, they still will forgive you. There still will be that sense of gratitude and 
the mystery of we're learning together and we're in this together. So that's why I never want to lose that notion of charity from this sector. Mm -hmm. One last question. It was right there. No, it's not there. It is there. Okay. Uh, you sort of answered it before, but um, I'll, I, I guess I can ask you to dig into it deeper. Um, I thought it, it struck me when you were talking about um, that idea, the notion of those, all those, those charities that are out there that are all those NGOs, um, that, you know, in some ways you represent two sides of that coin. Um, <laughs> YGAP is an excellent um, organisation, but one that's very, very small in comparison to World Vision. So how do you think we should be reconciling that? You've talked a lot about the fact that we need to, you know, thinking about not replicating, maybe joining together, but do you think that that's, um, like, what's the way forward on that, aside from the Charities Commission? How do we get, is it, is it NGOs going out there and saying, we've got to band together, or is it, like, what, what can we actually do to stop replicating and to start making sure we're after the one goal? So, um, one of the things, I, I chair the Community Council for Australia, which is a peak body for lots of charities, domestic and overseas, we are uh, funded by, I think it's my foundation, PWC working with us, doing CEO forum, CEOs of not-for-profits around the country, saying, let's actually take control of this future. The public are sensing already a compassion fatigue. Who wants to be stopped in the street for another donation and cold contact over your meal at night? This is actually damaging the sector. And let's try and take control of what's, you know, the for-purpose sector here. Um, how do we share back offices? How do we do this? A lot of the big international charities have done this with their field partners around the world. They, they actually have been. So we're in nearly 100 countries with 45,000 staff where the votes are actually in the developing world, not in the first world. We've, we've done a, a, a structure of governance to shift power. Um, in Australia, you know, it's the unfairness and arbitrary nature of um, uh, what touches human hearts. If it's child leukaemia, that will touch us much more deeply than homeless people or mentally ill people. There is. In the overseas sector, we will respond to a natural disaster going, that could be us, not to a protracted conflict like Syria. So we raised $11 million for the Nepal earthquake a year ago in one week. In Syria, where 30,000 kids have died, two, nearly 280,000 well, 280, adults, we've raised about $4 million. The suffering is far greater but it's a protracted conflict. And the brain isn't wired to actually give, even though the suffering's far greater. So as a sector, we're saying, how do we overcome this together? So we, with the Oxfams and SAVES, who collaborate a huge amount, and you may not think that, observing it here, but we collaborate a huge amount, are saying, how do we crack you know, that, that one? And then we're doing it on the domestic front too. I was just to add to that, um, YGAP's been through one merger and we're thinking about an acquisition of an organisation you might have heard of called World Vision. So once we, <laughs> <laughs> once we complete that, we'll cover that little uh, issue. Um, I want to close with um, going right back to the, to the beginning. Um, and, you know, we're in an election, we're about to be in election mode. And so I would love you two to um, pitch for us what you would... You've got, you know, 12... 12 floors in the lift with the Prime Minister. What are you going to pitch him about our sector and the future of the social sector and, and the need for social impact in this country? Well, I, I would say that uh, the for-profit, for-purpose sector, the not-for-profit sector is the glue for Australia. Um, he may not know, I hope you do, that uh, it's not just a hundred billion dollar sector now, it's the second biggest employer after retail. And we don't get a seat at the table if there's a productivity review or a major thing. You know, the trade unions will be there, business will be there,
but we won't be there because we've been so fragmented and yet it is the glue, not just in dollar terms and employment, but in purpose terms, people who volunteer, people who want to make a difference, people who... So I would be pitching to him that uh, he really needs to take this sector seriously. Well, well I, I would, I'd love to talk about the innovation agenda um, and a meeting Adam Bant a couple of weeks ago with one of your members, one of your team members, uh, putting social in the innovation agenda. Um, but if I only had 12 lifts, I probably would talk about... Uh, 12, 12, 12 floors. 12 floors in the lift. I probably would talk about um, some of our xenophobic attitudes. And it is quite scary to think that vacation, uh, an, an organ, a nation built on migration is now moving in such a direction. Um, and Malcolm, that offered so much hope, you know, 2007, wanting to have a bipartisan support of the ETS scheme with Rudd, um, who throughout his time as a Liberal leader has, has shown promise around climate change, equality, around gay marriage and so many social issues that you would assume he would have an ability to quiet some of the, the really conservative right, and the Peter Duttons and others that want to um, continue this policy around um, ensuring that fear is sown into each of our minds and we consider the other as such a different thing to who we are when we're a nation built on migrants. So I'd make it clear that um, those xenophobic attitudes may always be with us, that that doesn't need to be an election issue at all. And for the, the amount of people locked up in Manus and Nauru that uh, we can call neighbours and part of our community as opposed to locking them up and forcing suicides as we saw on the weekend. I love the way that you're unconsciously with, because you're, you know, head of YGAP said 12 lifts, not 12 floors. So just like, <laughs> let's just get in another lift. 12 lifts <laughs> now and shoot this out. Um, listen, I, you know, a couple of bottles of red and we could have sat here all night, I reckon, um, with everyone. I'll be able to share it. <laughs> Um, it's been a really great discussion. There are so many more things to talk about with you too. There are so many unanswered questions, but I hope that tonight you've had some of your questions answered and we've covered this topic as well as a little bit about these two. I think you need to know who these two leaders are in our country, but also where our sector's going, where it's come from. Um, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much, including the speed dating. Um, not with each other, Tim, with everyone here. <laughs> Um, so thank you. Please join me in thanking you.